again for, for your input and discussion. Um, we imagine that the, the discussions will in, interconnect and there was, will be overlaps between these discussions. But um, anyway, we're searching for a global solution and we need to go dig into each of these um, traditional policy and untraditional policy issues in, in, in fields. So um, I think we're now ready to discuss uh, the fiscal issue and maybe if we find out at the end that fiscal policy doesn't help, we may come back to the central banks, but uh, it's just um, a not very serious um, idea. So I would um, ask the next panelists um, now to, to come up. We have uh, an excellent panel, international panel with Robin Brooks from the Institute of International Finance, Frank von Leeuwen um, from the New Economics Foundation, uh, Antonella Stirati uh, from Roma Tre uh, University, and Shaheen Valier, uh, <clears throat> Valier from the German Council of Foreign Relations, who's um, main working or well, coming from France and, and Paris, and most of you know him. Um, so we have a very uh, international panel, and that uh, may help us to, to find out what, us, what are the different views on fiscal policy. Um, I would like to uh, ask Antonella to uh, start uh, um, uh, your presentation or your input for, for this session. Uh, where we want to know if um, the trillions that have been mobilized uh, now will be sufficient or what will be necessary to, to get uh, the econo economy restarted. I think we have some ideas collected already, but uh, now we may dig deeper into that question. So, Antonella, would you start? Okay, is it fine? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry I have no PowerPoint, so I hope I will present by points, so I hope that will be clear enough. Um, of course, I will be speaking mostly from an Italian perspective because I think that was uh, I was asked to do. I was uh, I'm here for, in a sense. And let me also say that I quite appreciated uh, both Inger and Gabor's presentations in the past session because I quite agree with what they say, both of them. Uh, so let's start from for with this fiscal policy. First thing, you are speaking about trillions, but I don't see in the Eurozone, and particularly in Italy, any trillions around. Uh, quite on the contrary, Europe, the Eurozone, Europe is doing much less than other countries, like the United States. Uh, and within the Eurozone, uh, this, let's say, le the less strong economies uh, that are also the most, um, damaged, let's say, from the uh, pandemic are those that are spending less. All the data we have, of course, the situation is in progress, there may be changes, but all published data suggests that Germany, for example, is spending a lot more uh, in the immediacy of the emergency of the pandemic than Italy or Spain. Uh, and Italy is actually spending the least, okay? The point is that even if we had a zero deficit this year, if the forecast about the GDP fall are correct, and they are between 9 and 11 percent fall for Italy, so suppose a 10 percent fall of GDP, uh, with no deficit this year we would go into a ratio of, uh, between debt and GDP of 150 percent. 150% from the 135% we have now. What I want to emphasize is that the GDP fall per se causes a wide increase in the debt to GDP ratio, whatever you spend, even if you don't spend at all, okay? This is very important for understanding the dilemmas of the Italian situation. To that, I would like to add some what I could say are now uh, results, which are consensus results, I think, to a large extent in macroeconomic literature, both 
Keynesian economists, mainstream economists, which are the following. First of all, the idea that there can be uh, expansive austerity has been cancelled, <laughs> you know, has been criticized, doesn't work. So we know that austerity has not only negative effects on GDP, but in most cases, it also has uh, persistent negative effects on GDP that go on for several years. The same goes for recessions. We have Blanchard and other papers, 2015, Fatah Summers, uh, 2008, etc. Just to mention the most uh, well well known, the best known economists that have shown that uh, recessions generally, all sorts of recessions, have permanent effects on GDP trajectories. So the idea that we, we can have a V or a U shaped uh, recovery after the after the pandemic crisis is not well founded. What we are going to see, especially if there is not much intervention, public intervention in fiscal policy, is a persistent level effect on GDP and employment. Okay, even if growth restarts, we will never reach the, the path where we were before, which was already quite slow path of growth. Why, finally, a, a quite consolidated result in macroeconomic literature is that precisely because you have these permanent effects on GDP, austerity policies, especially in a depressed economy, have perverse effects on the debt to GDP ratio. So austerity policies increase the debt to GDP ratio, do not decrease it. And this has happened a lot in the Eurozone, with the so-called Eurozone periphery. And it has happened in Italy, where we have had the first phase from the early 90s to before the 2008 crisis, in which we had austerity in a mild, let's say, mild form, but always primary surpluses. And this affected negatively the growth of the economy. We had a very slow growth, but we also managed to reduce the debt to GDP ratio. After 2008, more dramatic austerity policies that were forced on the country by the spread crisis in 2010 caused a sharp fall in GDP, almost equal to that of 2008, from which we have not recovered, even before we had not recovered before the pandemic and an increase in the debt to GDP ratio together, the two things together because of the fall of GDP. This must be borne in mind because I heard in these uh, days uh, people saying, okay, we need to spend a lot now because of course there are obvious income losses from the crisis, but then things will go back to normal and to the usual rules, okay? If we go back to so-called normal and usual rules, this will be a tragedy because primary surpluses in it after such a crisis will involve a permanent decline and the vicious circle that is a permanent increase of the debt to GDP ratio, not a fall, okay, not a decline. So this is the, I, I would say, the background. So in, against this background, what are the needs concerning um, fiscal policy. The needs concerning fiscal policy, I think for all Eurozone countries, or <laughs> all countries really, uh, in different degrees are measures now to, as was already said, to compensate for income losses due to the pandemic. So transfers and loans to households and firms, possibly targeted according to uh, needs and to the damages from the pandemic. Uh, but we'll also, we will also need afterwards, say, once we really go back to normal and in some ways cure vaccination, etc., we are rid of the virus, um, we will still need uh, quite a lot of stimulus to the economy to go back to a reasonably uh, satisfying growth path. Mm -hmm. And the more so, the deeper is the recession. Uh, so from the point of view of Italy, which I think is, this, is similar to the point of view of Spain and other European countries, 
uh, what you have is that now you risk that you have a deeper recession because you're not spending much, because there is still a margin of uncertainty about how far is the ECB going to buy the debt you have to issue to fund this emergency expenditure. So what's happening is that, as I said, the countries that need it more or most are those that are spending the least in the current uh, uh, emergency. And what you need afterwards is um, fiscal space for, uh, say, a reasonable stimulus to the economy, okay? Because you will need public investment. And I don't know about other countries, but in the, the case of Italy, we also have, because of such a long-standing path of fiscal surpluses, we also have a, a major, um, understaffing of important public sectors like health, like research, like uh, simply public administration. So what are the scenarios? If we, after, I think that now, I think the Italian government and possibly the Spanish government and the French government can risk spending a little more because this is useful. To, to avoid GDP decline, uh, assuming that the ECB will buy, not to cause a major damage uh, and instability. The problem is, the, uh, is in a year, in two years, what's going to happen? I, I mean, if Italy will be back to a scenario which you have to face either high interest rate, high spreads, and or austerity, if, if both together is a mess, complete mess, but even one of those is going to be uh, very difficult to cope with and very uh, likely uh, incompatible with democracy. I mean, Italian people are well, while they were ready to accept sacrifices in the, some years ago in the first crisis, let's say 2010, 2012, because they thought, they believed that would uh, sacrifices now to go back to growth and employment, etc. This did not happen, did not materialize. What we got was decline, unemployment, and higher debt to GDP ratio. So now Italian people are not ready to accept further sacrifice, uh, I think, even because Already before the pandemic, we were, for example, 4% employment below what we were in 2007. So we never recovered from the, from the previous crisis. So uh, a, a, a scenario, a framework of high interest rate and austerity is not acceptable. It's not consistent with democracy. It's going to cause, I think, Either it has to be imposed in some way which is consistent with democracy or will cause major uh, political turmoil. Um, so I think the only ways out are uh, in some ways to ensure low interest rates on public debt and some fiscal space, some scope for fiscal stimulus. This can be done in different ways. It can be the ECB running the business and uh, ensuring that spreads will not uh, amplify, ensuring low interest rates, and the European Commission ensuring that rules will be lifted for a while, or it can be something else, it can be uh, as it was suggested. I think all these other things are very, in the end, very similar. So saying that part of the public debt in the hand of the ECB is not counted as part of the debt to GDP ratio, or saying that you have some form of uh, debt issued by the Eurozone, by the European Commission, by the EU institution as a whole, that are then indirectly through secondary markets sold to ECB and that don't, do not count as um, the national debts, etc. Whatever works in a way that fiscal policies, expansionary fiscal policies can be funded without creating a pressure 
to go into that reduction uh, or a high interest rate austerity policy or high interest burden, etc. Any of, you know, I don't think it's so important what particular route is taken, but some route in this, some, something in this direction must be done. And there are many proposals around, you see the proposals coming from Spain, other coming from a number of economists, I would say of all orientations, because it's very clear that without some form of what in the end is a de facto monetary financing of fiscal policy, whatever the form it takes, even a hidden form, let's say through secondary markets, etc. de facto it must be there. Either a guarantee of rollover of debt, which comes down uh, the spreads, or a consolidation of the debt that is already in the public, uh, uh, in the central bank, or uh, new emissions from European institutions that finance. Uh, of course, in that case, it should be uh, investment plans that concern the Eurozone as a whole, not just Italy. Uh, which can be agreed upon. I don't think we, of course, then there must be a reflection about what kind of expenditure, how it has to be, you know, focused and targeted, etc. But the macroeconomic scenario must, must change, cannot go back to the old framework because that would be a major problem for the Eurozone, for this. For its viability, I would say. Thank you very much, Antonella. Uh, just before handing over to the, to the next one, I must say very personally that that's, I think, the very big drama we are in at the moment. That people in our country, in Germany, don't understand what has behind or what has been behind this, these developments in the last few years. There are some very bad people only telling. Uh, German public, look, they still have high debt. And so the, the, the thinking is they never did anything. Yeah. And the reality is... Fortunately, that's a kind of stereotype because it seems very much common sense that if you have a high debt, it's because you have spent a lot. But in fact, you can have a high debt in proportion to your income simply because you don't have an income. So the first solution is to have an income and then that becomes uh, a manageable. That's just to say that I, I think the real fundamental basic thing, human tragedy that, um, that people don't understand in Germany what has happened in, in Italy and the macroeconomics behind. So, but that's very personal view and it's very, in these days, I mean, today, tomorrow, uh, everything, a lot depends on that. But there are surveys telling us that Germans tend to understand when you explain what really happened. So that's a small hope. Um, just to hand over to Robin Brooks from the International uh, Institute for International Finance, of International Finance, um, to give us a view uh, from abroad. Okay, um, thanks very much. Um... I have been doing lots of video conferences where I've been speaking and saying great things, but I was on mute. So if you just let me know if you can hear me, uh, mm -hmm. that would be great. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. I, um, I loved listening to the previous panel. I actually have a question for Eric um, uh, and his idea for refinancing the stock of existing loans, his, his comment on LTROs and so forth. So I thought I'd quickly use two seconds to, to s talk about that, which is basically, um, you know, if I take out a mortgage and interest rates fall sharply, then I can refinance that mortgage at lower interest rates. And we have a financial market for that. Um, so my question is, why can't companies, in, in his case, in his example, refinance to uh, capture the benefit from lower interest rates? So the broader point is we are in an era, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit, we are in an era of policy activism. We believe that on many fronts we can use um, policy to solve problems and I think uh, 
part of what is happening is that what's getting lost is that markets obviously uh, do a lot of that. Um, and, uh, you know, market moves can be bad, but there's also a thing we, we call price discovery. And sometimes that's useful. So the balance uh, to strike is complicated. And, and so that was my question to Eric, listening to the previous panel. Um, I, um, I'm based in the US. Um, the title of this panel is, are a trillion enough or trillions enough? And so I thought I would try to answer that question through the lens of the United States. Um, and I would try and just give numbers on what we think the need is versus what has been done. And then uh, I think we need to have a bigger discussion about what the economy will look like in the medium term once the immediate crisis of this COVID virus is over, if it is over, ever. Um, and so I, let me start by talking about the United States, the shortfall, then I'll go into what the economy uh, may look like once we get out of this. And then I thought I would finish by talking about fiscal space and can we afford all this? So I, I'll talk about three things basically. Um, so what is the need? What is the requirement for fiscal action? And I think a good way that I've heard people discuss this is we basically have shut down big parts of the economy especially parts of the economy where social distancing is difficult. So movie theaters, airplane travel, um, uh, buses, trains, and so forth, uh, restaurants. And so there's lots of lost income. Um, people are not making wages uh, the way that they used to. And so one simple metric for what is the need, how many trillions do we need is, well, what is the income that has been lost and can we make that up? So in the United States, a reasonable estimate for the required makeup for this lost income is around four trillion. And all I'm doing, four trillion dollars, um, all I'm doing is I'm projecting the uh, national income at trend, and then I'm comparing that to the um, actual evolution of uh, nominal GDP uh, in our adverse scenario. We have a contraction of real GDP this year of around five and a half percent. That's the annual average number. Um, the peak to trough contraction is 9%. So it's a very, very sharp drop in GDP and therefore in incomes. So that's the need, $4 trillion. Um, as you guys know, the GDP of the United States in real terms is around 20 trillion. So what have we gotten so far? What has policy done to address this $4 trillion shortfall in income? Uh, so you obviously have seen the fiscal package, uh, the most notable uh, part of which was $2 trillion, um, that was uh, passed by Congress uh, a few weeks ago. So that's $2 trillion. We yesterday had the Senate pass uh, another um, $450, roughly, billion, and that will go to the House the lower part of the Congress for approval sometime this week. So then we're up to 2.5 trillion. Um, a lot of what has been agreed are basically measures to keep payroll running. Uh, so to keep wages being paid. So they address directly this shortfall in incomes. So for example, there was a paycheck protection program, which quite literally is giving loans to businesses so that they keep paying wages. And then those loans, if they are used for wages, are forgiven. Uh, so it's basically a grant to companies. And the magnitude of that is 350 billion. Uh, this was part of the 2 trillion. 
all of that has already been exhausted. So the additional 450 billion, the biggest chunk of that, I think around 315, 320 billion is for additional loans to businesses to pay wages. We then obviously also mailed checks to households. Um, and we also have uh, taken steps to increase unemployment insurance, all of which adds up to around uh, 620 billion or so in measures. We think the lost income through businesses is 750, so there's still some need. Going back to the big picture, the lost income is 4 trillion. We have now fiscal uh, stimulus that uh, has been agreed of uh, two trillion, uh, two point five trillion. I'm sorry. So we we expect another one and a half trillion to fully fill the hole. And so then we think the lost income will have been fully made up. So this is my perception of what the need for fiscal stimulus is, and for what so far has happened, we think that. Uh, we will get additional fiscal stimulus in the course of this year and then obviously next year too. All of that boils down to a fiscal deficit of 3.8 trillion uh, in this year. So I'm talking about fiscal year 2020. The US has a fiscal year that ends in September. It's always very confusing. Um, and then we are forecasting a fiscal deficit of 2.1 trillion in fiscal year 2021. So that's a 20% of GDP deficit in this year, basically 2020, and then a 10% slightly above deficit in fiscal year 2021. Can we afford that? So we're taking government debt from 80% before the corona shock to just under 110% of GDP. The post-World War peak in government debt for the United States, and of course, World War II was a huge thing. Uh, the post-World War II peak in debt was 108% of GDP. So we are taking debt up 30 percentage points of GDP and we are surpassing or matching the post-World War II level of government indebtedness. As you know, um, the un United States is kind of unique. We live in a dollar-based global system. Uh, that means trade is invoiced in dollars. Uh, many countries borrow in dollars and not in their own currency, and it gives the United States a unique standing in the global financial system. Some people call it an um, exorbitant privilege. What it means is that the United States, if you look across all countries, has seen the biggest drop in interest rates from before the corona shock, and it has seen the strongest currency. So, if the question very narrowly defined is, can we afford all this? Then the, quest, then the answer to that question is, yeah, it's no big deal. <laughs> we, we can probably do a lot more in the very short term. Um, but I think the question becomes more complicated. The reality is that uh, government finances are about intergenerational transfers. We are, if we are spending today, it implies a burden on future generations. And it implies, um, unless we inflate away the debt, it implies higher taxes on future generations. And so there is a trade off um, in terms of our consumption versus the consumption of future generations. And so when making that trade off, uh, I think it's really important to recognize that we are basically using up degrees of freedom in 
the very large fiscal stimulus that we've done here in the United States. There is nothing that says, there is no law that says the exorbitant privilege of the United States will stay forever. It can change. Maybe it won't change in the short term, but I would say a 30% of GDP uh, increase in debt uh, is something that should give us pause. Um, the most important thing in all of this, and this is the last thing that I'll say, is we need to think about whether the coronavirus shock that we're all struggling to deal with is a one-off shock, or is it a new normal? In other words, is this something that could, could be prolonged? Can we have shutdowns of our economy that last a long time? Or can we two years, three years down the road, we'll have COVID 20, 2022. You know, is, is, can we have more of these viruses? And then we have to think about even the United States with its exorbitant privilege, um, can we do another 30% of GDP in debt on top of the 30% that we've done already? I think at that point, things start to look very complicated. And so the reality is that Apart from the fiscal stimulus discussion, we have to have a discussion about what will the economy look like when this is done. So if I total up in the United States, movie theaters, restaurants, gambling, Las Vegas, um, if I total up transportation and all kinds of services where social distancing is difficult, then that's about 20% of GDP. It's 20% of the United States economy. So we may be dealing with a more medium term output loss. And we need to find ways to deal with that um, that don't involve a medium term fiscal expansion. And the answer is that we need to think about the global transmission channels of this virus. In the end, it's a public health crisis, right? So we need to think about, do we have global standards for testing so that next time we know when this thing is coming down the pipe in a reliable fashion? We didn't know this time. And I think that is a big issue going forward. And that's not a fiscal issue. That's really a global public health is a public good. And we need to develop an infrastructure so that the next virus we detect early and we can quarantine the right parts of the global economy so that we don't have this massive uh, synchronized shock that basically means we need global fiscal expansion, et cetera. Um, so I think a lot of the answers here in the medium term, honestly, I hope are not fiscal, but they are in the public health domain and in policy coordination across countries. Let me end there. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, so we come back from Rome to Washington to Paris now. Um, I don't think, Shaheen, if you're in Paris, but uh, usually you are. And just to mention this at, at another personal level, we're very much talking about this disease. And in fact, we have some uh, speakers um, who have recovered from this disease. And as you made it very public, Shane, you are among them and happy to see you back here and in health. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Very happy to, to be with you as well. And I have recovered in, in, indeed. I, I had probably the mild version of the virus, so I, I, was, I was lucky. Um, uh, the presentation by Robin uh, was excellent and rooted in the U.S. Mine is going to be um, rooted in Europe, but um, but maybe first before I go into the specifics of what fiscal policy and fiscal stimulus would mean in Europe, I think it's important to take a step back and to see how this crisis um, challenges, I think, what a lot of um, economic theory uh, would suggest. I think many of us in this group would be, I think, could be qualified as Keynesian or Neo Keynesian. And I think some of the tools that we have are not necessarily appropriate to think through 
uh, fiscal policy in this in, in this time. Um, in particular, because we actually cannot really stimulate demand at this point when the economy is shut down, and so a lot of the easy reflexes that we would have may not be the most uh, appropriate uh, tools at this moment. So I think beyond the size of the stimulus, which I think is important, I think the form that it takes is equally, if not, if not more important. Um, and there's been, in the very beginning at least, I think it's improving, but it's still not there, a lot of confusion in the numbers that were being presented as to what these numbers really amount to. For instance, um, uh, you know, a, a large part of the guarantees to the corporate sector that were extended were presented as a quasi-stimulus, which I don't think they are, or I don't think should be measured exactly in the same way that a, a real fiscal expenditure uh, uh, would be. Uh, so I, I think we have to take a step back and wonder uh, what are the tools available in situations like that and maybe question some of them. Um, governments in general have been very quick to develop a wide range of instruments to put the economy on hold and freeze um, uh, the corporate sector, protecting uh, essentially its liabilities and allowing it to borrow, but also using the corporate sector as a vehicle to essentially deploy uh, and compensate for uh, the lack of social safety nets. So uh, Emmanuel Macron had a very interesting um, uh, argument in his uh, last FT interview, where he basically said, um, what we did during this crisis is essentially to nationalize the entire payroll. And this is technically what happened. In the countries where um, this could be done through the unemployment insurance system is what it was done that way, either directly or through the partial unemployment or through partial unemployment systems. And in the countries where it was not, what what essentially took place, either directly or indirectly, is are basically loans that allow corporates to keep people on the payroll uh, for as long as as needed. And I think this is you know something to to to, to think about uh, you know very importantly. The, the, the second thing, I think, is to think about these guarantees and about equity uh, injection. Um, I was very struck to see it. So my sense is that a lot of these guarantees, as the economy weakens, will be called upon. And the real question for governments will be, how do they honor the guarantee? Do they honor the guarantees by essentially extending credit to these corporates you know, at infinitum or at very long-term maturities, or they use these guarantees that are being called upon as avenues to basically take control over these companies. And I think this is a fundamental question, both in economic policy terms and industrial policy. Are we going, as a result of these guarantees that have been extended, are we going to nationalize a third of the economy uh, or 50% of the economy in the next 24 months? Or is this just a temporary support and in that case we have to be clear it's temporary support for shareholders with um, uh, with, with with public money um, the last uh, uh, point I want I want to raise on, on on the framing is is about the financial system so this crisis is not first and foremost a crisis of the financial sector and in fact in many ways we are using the financial system as an instrument to actually deliver the stimulus or to deliver the help. Um, and that, I think, means indirectly, even though we haven't said it, that we will have to backstop the financial system entirely. So, you know, we're basically doing it indirectly now by basically allowing the, the, the banks to lend with government guarantees. But in practice, if you use the financial system as a vehicle through which you deliver stimulus either to households or to corporates, by virtue of this becoming your instrument, I think you have to backstop it. So I think what we're effectively doing, in my mind, without really saying it, is a big reversal from the conclusions of the, of the, 2000, of the global financial crisis. We're effectively saying that we are backstopping the financial system uh, no matter what, which is a big departure, I think, from, from the conclusions that were reached after the global financial crisis. 
now let me turn to, 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 to Europe very quickly. What is striking in Europe is the very wide range of, um, of fiscal uh, measures that were taken and, and the dispersion between you know, Germany uh, putting out a very bold policy, policy response and other countries, including those countries that are more affected, Italy, Spain, um, and, and, and Portugal, uh, not able to, to, to do the same. And I think that boils down to a real issue about uh, and real questions about future uh, long-term fiscal sustainability. And I think until these questions are addressed, and this is why I think the European Council that is taking place tomorrow is so central for uh, for the Europe uh, for the European fiscal response and for the integrity of the euro area. I think until this question is uh, is is addressed, uh, we will have a fundamentally divergent uh, economic policy response that will effectively turn what was a symmetrical shock into an asymmetrical shock, deepening economic divergences uh, inside the euro area. And so I worry very much that we have, that we're repeating essentially the same mistakes of the last crisis, which can be viewed, although we can debate this, as you know, an external shock in the form of the global financial crisis, turning into an asymmetric homegrown shock in Europe because of policy mistakes. I think we're basically exactly the same position you know, fast forwarding, uh, you know, a, a, a big symmetrical shock with the pandemic being turned into an asymmetric shock because of our uh, inability to respond to it in, in common. I worry also that the window for deciding of a common response is actually narrow. Um, if we don't agree to something of that nature uh, tomorrow or in the coming weeks, I think it will be more difficult to agree to it in six months' time for the very reasons that I think the divergence will be more pronounced and more rapid. Um, Germany is effectively starting to uh, lift its confinement measures, Austria as well, the Netherlands will soon too. And so what we will realize very soon is that these economies who actually had a, a shallower uh, shock are able to rebound much quicker. And I think the willingness on the part of these countries to share the burden with Italy, Spain, and others, we may still be in lock, which may still be in a lockdown, will actually diminish and not increase with time. So I think it's really a moment of a, a moment of truth, uh, and the fundamental question, and that goes back to the previous panel, uh, you know, beyond the fiscal mutualization, is is whether we agree to a level of monetization of, of, of this debt, uh, and and to some extent, you know. Uh, Echoing what Robin was saying about the uh, the exorbitant privilege, and this, given the size of the American issuance, I, I don't think we should view this in, in absolute terms, uh, because the privilege is a relative concept. Uh, and so, what really matters is is the American stimulus uh, really extraordinarily large uh, in comparison to others. And right now, it is the case. So, I think your 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 concerns about the the, the exorbitant privilege are valid, but you know it could be that you know uh, the euro area also decides to you know monetize twenty percent of its uh, twenty percent of, of of its uh, debt to GDP, and and if it does that, then you know the American expansion and monetization will be large in absolute terms, but will be acceptable or, or you know relative to the benchmark of other large uh, international reserve currencies. So I think what is at stake here is, is, is twofold. The ability of the euro area to stay together as an entity, because I think if we have such profound divergences, uh, they will come to fracture the euro, the euro area. And, and then the ability of the euro to stay on as an international reserve currency. Because if, if, if we don't uh, come together with a strong economic policy response, I think it will not only weaken individual economies in the euro area, but it will weaken the single currency. Uh, as, uh, as, as a reserve currency. I think I will, I will end here. Many thanks, Shane. Um, I think some common points in our discussions have been that um, there has been a lot of money mobilized to, to handle with the short-term necessity to, to hold up uh, or to, to yeah, like you said, on the payroll, to pay the, the payroll and to, to avoid some uh, collapses in, in short term, and then we 
probably mostly agree on the fact that there's there will be a debt problem or debt overhang problem, and that the, the the short term, even if it's effective, the short term help will not avoid that there's some output losses and um, and then again, third element seems to be that what Robin also said that there may be a durable effect and something like um, like more uncertainty about what happens and will there be another shock and, and so on. And this leads me to our last panelist um, because there are a lot of discussions also. I mean, it may not be only an, another pandemic. Um, we may be confronted to other uh, shocks that have similar effects, global effects or some uh, disruptions in, in, in the economy, which may be climate re related so there may be a whole potential for for discussion on how to frame fiscal policies in the sense of avoiding or make us more resilient to to future shocks um frank van Leeuwen has worked a lot on on green deal with the new Econ uh, new economics foundation in in, uh, in london and now um will present some ideas on how to bring these ideas together to make a longer term recovery plan, which is also on the table for tomorrow's EU summit. Um, so please, Frank, your turn. Um, thanks very much, um, Thomas, and, and for having me today. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I did prepare a presentation, so I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, can can you see my screen okay? Yes. Yeah. No. yeah. Okay. Um, so before continuing, I, I, I just wanted to kind of situate the context of the crisis in terms of where we're at and, and how the New Economics Foundation perceives this. Um, in terms of, we, we basically see this crisis in, in being in, in three phases. The first is essentially the emergency phase in which um, there's an emergence, like an urgent response that is mobilized to stabilize the um, immediate negative impacts of the pandemic. The second is the maintenance phase whereby you know, many of the emergency measures are essentially, um, might have to be repeated, but new temporary measures may also be needed to readjust the economy to the, the new normal of businesses and households um, business is shutting down, households having to stay at home. And then the third phase is, is what we're calling the recovery phase in which measures to stimulate and rebuild, rebuild the economy um, are implemented. And so my presentation is essentially focused on that third phase, the, the recovery phase. And I should say that this analysis and this piece of work was actually done um, in January this year. So so I, I just kind of want to caveat to that it has not necessarily parts of it I've tried to, but we haven't, for example, updated our modeling um, for, for most recent events. So before the corona pandemic, um, annual growth was at its lowest in a decade in the context. In the UK context, um, recent figures suggest that our flagging economy um, essentially narrowly dodged um, a failure by avoiding a recession. Beginning of the year, the likelihood of another recession was higher than at any time um, since 2007. The question wasn't really a matter of when the next economic down was coming, but what to do when the economy was shrunk. So, in the, in, in the midst of the corona pandemic, we know that the economic downturn is here. So, the obvious question um, then is what to do. And so, in our April, Scaling up zero carbon investment was essentially a, a really huge um, missed opportunity. So our calculations show that if, if just one third of the coalition government in the UK's um, tax cuts between 2010 and 2013 had instead been used to fund a mass home insulation program, um, which would have cost about 10 billion, emissions from UK homes would be at least 30% lower today, um, just 5% um, Three years, the energy savings to household bills would amount to under 
underlying cost of the program. So after three years, the cost of the program would have paid for itself. In fact, by 2018, the program would have um, saved the household sector about 32 billion worth in energy bills. So a clear lesson from the recovery to the 2008 small, um, too short-sighted, and lacking the right focus. Um, amidst the policy chaos that followed immediately after the last crisis, policymakers were invariably, they, they had to invariably make um, decisions in the days and not weeks. Um, and as we're seeing, as we're seeing, um, seeing now, these types of decisions obviously have a long term, can have a long-term long impact over the direction of the economy. Uh, Frank, just um, because there seems to be a problem with your mic, uh, it's going up and down. Maybe you should be careful not to touch it or to. Okay, can you hear me now if I speak a bit closer? Yeah, it seems to. Seems to speak again. Can I try now? Yeah, it's going up and down. Maybe I'm sharing my screen that it doesn't work. Um, can I? Let me just try this. Can you hear me better now? Yes, seems. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen. I'll, I'll share slides later. So according to um, leading economists, Olivier Blanchard and Larry Summers, a particular problem with the last recession um, was that policymakers didn't really have a, essentially a readily available blueprint that could have helped them navigate um, through the next economic downturn. So policy improvisation essentially um, won the day, and the, the longer term view essentially was missed. Ten years on, the government is now faced with you know, two huge um, considerable policy challenges. The first is, is the alarming lack of progress in reducing UK carbon emissions to meet the UK's climate goals, the so-called The second is the powerless of, of monetary policy makers aid, aid recovery. Um, over, overburdened with all the counter-cyclical heavy lifting of the last recession, central banks proved to be um, Eric in their current guise and the way they're currently being used um, represent a, a, essentially a lack of ammunition to aid recovery. I don't, I, I'm completely in, in line with Eric's thinking that, that we can upgrade their toolkits or at least um, revise the way central banks think about using their, their toolkits in, in more creative ways. Um, Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, recently echoed other central bankers, such as you know, Mario Draghi or Christine Lagarde, in suggesting that central banks lack the ammunition to prepare for another downturn. Uh, Frank, there's still an issue with your mic. Maybe you shouldn't move. Sometimes it seems as if when you move, it's going on. Okay. okay, I will try not to move. Um, let me move a little bit closer, please. Um, can you hear me okay now? Yes. Try. Um, okay, one last try would be this. Um, any standalone monetary stimulus in its current form may prove counterproductive to boosting the economy and could be laced with um, a carbon bias that would risk contradicting progress with the Paris climate goals. Um, but, but the point we try and make in our paper is that within this, this perilous position, there is a clear potential for change. Um, not only do we need an economic roadmap to help us raise living standards and beat um, the corona's downturn, but it should contain the largest green stimulus package that is feasibly, feasibly possible. This means we need fiscal policy to step in and come out from the cold. Um, in the corona recovery, treasuries and ministries of finance um, can't throw central banks under the bus like they did the last time by leaving central banks solely in charge of stimulating the economy whilst running fiscal austerity, which has the opposite effect. Um, the bulk of the response to the corona recession needs to come from fiscal policy and it needs, in my view, to be as green as possible. A significant portion of that stimulus should aim to boost zero carbon infrastructure and entail a, a significant reskilling and training program. Um, to be clear, the green um, stimulus package that we envision should also include monetary easing. It should be aimed at enhancing the welfare system, and there should be certain tax cuts. 
but a sizable portion should be aimed at investment um, by fiscal and monetary coordination. Um, we desperately need to scale up investment in a socially just way to tackle climate breakdown, and we should have started yesterday. Um, so the nature of our response to, to this recession could ultimately prove the difference um, between whether progress towards um, climate targets are met or derailed. In the UK, the government's promises to be the greenest government were last time shelved in the name of austerity. Um, and recovery from a recession can no longer be thought in terms of returning to a status quo. Um, the policy response must be used to reprogram the nature, direction, and purpose of the economy. It must begin by, by sowing the seeds of a more resilient recovery, and the response to the recession needs to become a springboard to a, a different, a more sustainable future. But for all this to be possible now, we have to start putting in the groundwork, and we need to start formulating plans now. Um, all branches of government should formulate long-term plans for making um, a just green transition and within such plans there should be contingency strategies and measures to be implemented in good times and in bad times. Um, in any case, um, to aid such planning, we in our paper we identify a number of, of key criteria worth considering when selecting projects. And this is a key, like a key aspect of our work and I wish I could show my slides. Um, but essentially we look at timeliness, as in shovel readiness of projects, the barriers to projects, the sequencing of projects, um, the multiplier effects, both the, the employment and the income multiplier um, effects of, of, of different projects, um, as well as the carbon impact and the, the ability of, of, of different projects to target slack in different areas of the economy. Um, and essentially we come up with a few different programs that, that could be incorporated. Um, most of these would, would essentially be aimed at home insulation, um, uh, enhancing electronic vehicles and networks, um, flood, drought and defense systems, renewable, renewable energy, energy networks, walking and cycling, infrastructure, tree planting, heat pumps, and, and um, a number of other things as well. We apply these criteria to build an illustrative green stimulus package, and, and we, we show that you can use this package to respond to a recession in the next um, five years. The key message of our report is that while these measures could, could take slightly longer to implement than a tax cut or a reduction in interest rates, the lack of a meaningful recovery from the last recession, epitomized by essentially a decade of stagnant wages, um, that really haven't re, um, recovered to, to pre-crisis levels shows that a short-term um, boost to economic activity by itself is, is, is essentially um, overrated. Um, and if I may, I, I wanted to show our modeling and stuff, but I don't have the slides for it. What I, what I, I do want to say though is in terms of, of, of the debt part of, of this, this package, I think it's super important, first of all, I believe a green fiscal stimulus will, will effectively pay for itself. That is, that, that's the way I think we should be looking at this. Um, I, I really liked some of the, the, the points that, that Robin was making. Um, I think we should be clear about when we talk about intergenerational aspects that borrowing to build a hospital or invest in, in, in climate today, um, it, it actually helps to spread the costs of borrowing across generations in terms of interest payments and so forth. So, so, so it's quite useful as well. And, and sometimes this is forgotten. The other aspect to that is, is we tend to focus solely on the liability side of the balance sheet and not the asset side. And in the, in, in, in the future, our grandchildren might be upset about debt, but they'll probably be more upset about what the climate looks like. Um, now, and, and the, the final thing just to say is, is when we focus solely on debt to GDP figures and, and, and these big numbers, completely for, there's this tendency, especially from governments, to, to, to focus on fiscal risks and ignore the, or neglect the risks that build up in other parts of the system. And for example, we have in the UK now the weakest, going into the corona pandemic, the, the weakest social um, security system in the world. Um, we've also, by running austerity, we've constrained the social space of the private sector, both to respond to, to this crisis as well. So that was another key message, and we're working on this at NEF right now, is, is, is that 
by, by focusing solely on fiscal risks, um, governments tend to ignore or neglect the, the vulnerabilities and the risks that can build up elsewhere. And that's really important that that doesn't have, happen in moving forward. Uh, many thanks, Frank. Many thanks for, uh, for all of you. Um, just maybe a very spontaneous first question to bring the first and the last one together. Uh, how does that uh, sound for you and Antonella? I mean, maybe personally you're very um, engaged in, in, in the idea of a Green Deal, but how does that look for Italians at the moment to say that we now need a Green Deal? You should unmute, please. Now you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Well, so in the first place, I would say we need the money for the Green Deal. So uh, how is it going to be financed? Is it going to be financed by a common uh, debt instrument at the Eurozone level, which will not be on the on the Italian shoulders in terms of, of debt to GDP ratio. If so, it's a you know very interesting addition to what the Italians can do on their own you know fiscal policy. If it has to be on Italian shoulders, then the, the problem is the scenario I was mentioning before. For course, of course, we would need fiscal stimulus. A part of it would also come from investments that can be related to the Green New Deal. For example, for sure, Italy needs a lot of maintenance and innovation and improvement in public transports, both at the national and local levels, which could be related to such uh, green, generally green goals. But the point is, uh, can, we, can we do that? How, how much are the spread? <laughs> How much are we going to be asked to run a surplus? Of course, if we have to run a surplus, we will not be able to have any green new deals. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I could add that if it has to come out of, um, let's say, Italian budget, uh, there are some fields in which we have strong needs, I think, that we can overlap with green objectives. One is, is public transportation, as I said. I think there are other uh, urgency in, uh, in the Italian budget which have to be met uh, perhaps before, for example, health, for example, education and research, which have been very much um, cut in the last uh, 10 years or so, so you know, it's a matter of how you, how, what is the general scenario, I think. But I think any kind of uh, European level project of investing in a coordinated way that can be of stimulus of the economy and also uh, improve the infrastructure and also socially desirable goals will respond, it's very well, very well done. Uh, I have some comments on uh, particularly on Robin's uh, presentation, but I don't know if this is the right moment to, to make them or... Yes, please go ahead. Right? Yes, I have, uh, you know, since he raised the problem, which is a very common, you know, common in the discussion, which is that of the uh, intergenerational transfer connected with the higher debt to GDP ratio, no? The, the fact that if we spend a lot now and if the debt to GDP increases a lot, this is a burden that we leave to future generations. Now, I don't want to underplay the problems that can be generated by higher debt to GDP ratio in other respects, the autonomy of monetary policy, or I don't know. But uh, one should bear in mind that there is another question. What would be the alternative scenario? I mean, if we believe, I mean, if the public intervention and public expenditure is useless, then of course we are raising a debt that must be then financed at least in terms of interest payments by taxation, and this is going to be a burden. But if the fiscal expenditure has a real effect on uh, GDP per capita, on public infrastructure, 
per capita or in general for the country on private investment because if you don't have fiscal expenditure and this means a deep crisis this affects also private investment private private research so what you leave to the next generation if public expenditure is effective on all these uh, fronts you leave more debt more uh, burden for interest payment but we also leave higher gdp per capita higher private wealth which are the consequences of higher gdp higher private capital infrastructure and higher public capital infrastructure so i'm not sure that uh, if you I mean why should we look only at the burden and not the, at the resource side uh, of the intergenerational transfer. I think this we should try to avoid to fall into the into views that are inherited from a economic uh, you know analytical framework which is very monetarist in the sense that since it is useless because in the end potential output is always determined by other forces and is independent of public intervention then you're right then it's just a bargain but if we don't think in that in those terms so we think that potential output is something that can be changed by public policy then uh, the, the picture is different uh, Shaheen, you, you've been talking about um, what Macron has said in the recent uh, two or three weeks and it seemed to me also that this has been at least much more visionary than what we used to hear in, in Germany from um, Ms. Merkel, uh, who's doing a, certainly a good job short term, but, but uh, not, maybe not in this visionary terms. Would you think that there is a potential in France to, to make such a recovery plan out of what Macron has said, like, we need to restructure our economies and societies after this crisis and so on. What would you expect? Uh, you're right that his speeches are usually quite visionary, but the implementation of policies is far less visionary. Um, and that's been true since the beginning of his presidency, and I think that, that remains true. Um, I worry that, um, you know, behind the grand statements and the visionary um, ideals that are uh, voiced by Macron, the economic policy response will be quite traditional. And for instance, in some of the areas that we mentioned earlier, you know, how much um, the government will want to take over parts of the economy and uh, really push them strongly in the direction of, of green transition is very unclear to me. Uh, if you take two examples, uh, which I think undoubtedly will require government bailouts. Uh, one is Air France, uh, Air, the national airline company, which is actually co-owned by uh, the Dutch government. It's a joint venture, Air France and KLM. Uh, will this uh, be the occasion to radically, radically change the business model of Air France uh, and uh, short, short distance domestic flights and, and, and really try to accelerate the green transition of an airline company like this? I, I doubt this. I think the pressure to resume and try to get Air France in its, uh, in its business as usual will be very strong. If you take another example, which is Renault. Uh, the national uh, uh, auto uh, uh, company, which was before the crisis, I believe, already owned at 23% by the government. Uh, it will inevitably have to be bailed out. Um, will this be used to uh, push Renault towards a radical change away from diesel and explosion engine towards uh, green and electric vehicle? I'm not entirely entirely sure. So, so I think um, the the grand vision and grand statements uh, may not be exactly matched by by policy action uh, down the line. And I think to some extent that depends also on on the ability to create a bit of European uh, unity on these issues. Uh, in reality, what has happened. Uh, with this crisis is the entire explosion of the state aid rule framework 
uh, which I think was necessary given the, the government support that was required to back up the economy, but which may pose very important questions of level playing field down the line. Actually, this is also one thing that Macron mentioned in his interview, and I think rightly so, when he mentioned that basically we have completely uh, you know, thrown uh, the treaty rules outside the window, and that creates a fundamental level playing field issue. I think the big question is, you know, as we exit the crisis and as we uh, work towards a roadmap to exit that crisis, will we put in place um, European, uh, a European framework that actually encourages government to, uh, you know, stay clearly within the, the framework of the Green Deal and to level the playing field? And I'm, I'm not entirely sure that we will have enough uh, coordination. Uh, today, the European Commission and the European Council issued a roadmap towards the economic recovery, and they are going to present this roadmap to the European leaders tomorrow. It's a it's a five pages document. I don't think a, a, a seventeen year old uh, bachelor student in its first year of economics would have written a document so bad. Uh, it's it, it it's 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 really embarrassing. Uh, so. Um, so the, the worry I have is really that we have, you know, um, you know, completely destroyed the entire European economic policy framework and that we'll be back to national solutions that, uh, that you know, could, 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 could be quite detrimental on, on the whole. Um, thank you, Shaheen. We even in Germany have a professor of economics who he writes such papers. Should be a little polemic on that. Uh, Robin, um, maybe some ideas on um, is, I mean, you've been talking about the need for maybe not have a new normal, but something which is different. Is there anything in the US policy that can can be seen or can be um, de developed in that sense? Uh, no. <laughs> um. So I don't think the U.S. Um, policy approach to the medium-term challenge um, is uh, well articulated. Um, I mean, if you look at the policy response in the United States at the moment, even though we have a federal government, the decisions on when to reopen uh, the economy are being made at the state level. I had, uh, I heard one comparison that this is equivalent to having a public swimming pool and allowing to people, allowing people to pee in one section of the public swimming pool and not in the other. It just makes no sense. Um, so we have a policy coordination issue here. Um, we have disagreement between governors. Uh, I live in the state of Maryland. Um, we actually have a Republican government uh, governor. He bought uh, uh, coronavirus test kits from um, Korea and imported them, flew them, flew them to Maryland so that we can do more testing and was of course promptly criticized by the US president. So there are lots of private um, initiatives. So I am aware of, for example, MIT leading a bunch of academics who are testing and modeling reopening the economy and looking at the trade-offs. Um, for policymakers, the problem itself is not uh, a new one, right? We, for example, for highways, we have speed restrictions to reduce the incidence of accidents and deaths. Uh, and we're trading off the speed with which you reach your target uh, or your destination versus the incidence of deaths. So in principle, the problem we're dealing with, we know how to, how to deal with in terms of economics. We just don't have political um, um, coherence. Um, I wanted to come back briefly to Antonella. So I, I think she's right, uh, obviously. And Frank also made this point. There is an asset side. Um, I think a focus purely on intergenerational transfers is 
just one side of the equation. I agree with that. Um, and for the record, I also believe that, um, you know, Italy and uh, Spain in particular in the Eurozone have lots of pre-existing conditions, right? Um, they entered uh, this crisis with, uh, in my opinion, big output gaps and so forth. So, but I also think Italy is a good example of this intergenerational issue. Um, as we all know, Italy has been, has been a poster boy for fiscal rectitude recently. And the debt issue in Italy is a, is a debt legacy issue. It's from the past. And so it is an intergenerational issue uh, that is very unfortunate. Um, and I think I, I regret very deeply that um, European political leaders so far are not taking explicit action to um, go in the direction of Corona bonds, because I think in particular in this case, I think it would be a, a good way forward. Um, so I think, um, where we are at the moment is we're basically doing Corona bonds through the ECB balance sheet and through the back door. Uh, and I wish for political transparency, it were being done explicitly through actual Corona bonds. Um, I think the current situation in Europe is politically unsustainable because I'm a German myself originally. It's one of my best features. And I think Germans dislike um, the ECB being used as this quasi-political vehicle, and I think it politicizes the ECB, and it's quite dangerous. Let me stop there. Thank you, Robin. There's a question um, from Eric. Would you come in? Still there? Eric? Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, it was just for Shaheen and Antonella, um, which is that I, I actually think that Germany, and, and I put this out um, to you as well, Thomas, is, you know, if, if, if I was coming, looking at the world from a German perspective, Germany has been a contrarian against the consensus on fiscal policy globally for most of the last decade. Every major institution, every mainstream economist outside of Germany has said Germany should be easing fiscal policy. And they've also been advocating that Europe needs to have some kind of mutual fiscal policy. And Germany has said no, because, and Germany, I feel, will say, we've been right and you were wrong. <laughs> because if we'd eased fiscal policy for the last decade, we wouldn't have had the financial resources to cope with this crisis. So we've been completely vindicated. So we stand alone and we're right. And you're now saying to us, oh, give us, uh, give us some of your fiscal space. No way. This comes against the backdrop where the original deal was, we're going to devolve, we're going to lose monetary sovereignty. The Bundesbank, one of the most critical pillars of German post-war economic stability, we're going to mutualize monetary policy you now want to mutualize fiscal policy and you've all been wrong and we've been right. It's not going to happen. Right? That's first point. Second point, BTP yields are rising. And as Antonella pointed out, Italy's fiscal stimulus in reality has been one of the weakest. Italy faces a budget constraint today, not a future budget constraint, a current budget constraint. So how do we square this circle? Um, by the way, Eric, that's maybe can I answer quickly? Yeah, yeah. I, I have a, a slightly more generous view of, of what the German uh, thinking is. Uh, I think Germany knows that it will have eventually to uh, share some of its fiscal space with the others. Uh, but I think what Germany wants is that it only shares this fiscal space in return for complete control over the policies of others. And this is effectively why they have 
uh, pushed for the ESM as a solution and instrument for this crisis, while everybody actually understands that it's absolutely an inappropriate instrument to respond to the economic challenge we're facing. So I think the real break in Germany is not so much to accept risk sharing or mutualization, which I think deep down is accepted, even though it's not uh, openly accepted. I think the real shift is basically for Germany to accept that it will have to share its fiscal space and mutualize risks without being able to impose and control policies on Italy and the others. And I think that's the big that's the big shift. I think what Germany has not accepted, has not understood, is that if it wants to impose the ESM on Italy, it will have to deal with Salvini as prime minister within six months, and it will have to deal with a real plan to leave the euro area, which Germany doesn't want. I think Germany could have tolerated Greece leaving the euro area because it was so small that it was irrelevant. I don't think Germany can accept Italy leaving the euro area. And so to me, the, 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 the real thing that needs to shift in, 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 in Germany, but also it, it raises profound questions on the rest of Europe, <clears throat> is what sort of uh, political integration we need in Europe to make fiscal risk sharing acceptable to Germany. The political integration Germany has in mind is what Jean-Claude Trichet referred to as federalism, federalism by exception, which is basically, once you fuck up, we take control over your country. This is what basically what happened in the last crisis. I think that's not a model that's politically sustainable for Europe. And so is there an alternative political model? Can we actually agree? And this is why I thought that I think the discussions that are currently taking place on using the EU budget is very interesting. If Germany accepts that, that it, actually the EU budget could borrow and grant rather than loan money to other countries, I think it would be a very important step in the right direction. Um, we will get into the deeper technical discussion of all that in the next session where we are discussing Eurobonds and what will be decided tomorrow. Um, but I just wanted to, to say something on Eric. I, what, what you described as a, a potential German reaction is exactly what I get in some uh, readers' um, emails on, on my column from Germans. And that's exactly, you know, we've been right, now we have the capacity and we, it's their fault if they didn't do the same thing uh, up to now. The thing is that maybe it's important now and it's part of our mission. Um, Germany is, is not so clear anymore. You know, it's this is the one part and this is influenced by 10 years or more years where German economics has been dominated by very conservative right-wing people. And you know them and, and they have dominated the, the, the whole discourse and there was a finance minister, minister on the same side. I think the, the situation has changed, as you know, there are different, there's a different finance minister and we will have the chief economist of the finance ministry in the next session. And I think if you look into the, the discussion in Germany, it's very open at the moment. We have never had so many very prominent economists and politicians favoring Corona, bond, uh, corona bonds, uh, their new Euro bonds. That, very new, very um, not conservative people, but even some conservatives who are now saying that's the, the, the thing to do. And that's to do with people are realizing that we are not alone and that the situation is dramatic. And I mean, there's a lot of work still to do, but just, just to say, I think we're in a very open situation actually. And it's not the situation we had 10 years ago or five years ago even, where this very conservative economic uh, interpretation of the word has dominated against the rest of the world. So that's just to say. Anatona, Anna, Anna, Antonella, you've been asked to, to react on that. So, uh, Eric, I think your question, in, in fact, seems uh, to open up uh, questions which are very wide and very general. Uh, so, in a sense, that might surprise you. I may even agree on the fact that if a country has had a successful model of growth in the past, 
uh, it has to be shown that that has been successful. Of course, there have been distributive issues within Germany and also perhaps a growth that has been slower than in other parts of the world. But on the whole, if Germany has been successful in, the, in its model, it, it's quite uh, understandable that it doesn't want to change it too much. No, I mean, any other country would probably do the same. Another point is that uh, I agree, although this may surprise you again, but uh, it's, mm, I don't think, la at least not uh, fiscal transfers, at least large fiscal transfers cannot be done in Europe because in order to have fiscal transfers, you uh, need to have a political body. You need to have a political system and the political and the people that chooses that political the, the government, the decisions, the parliament, we have nothing of that. So as an Italian taxpayer, I would like to pay for bailing out Deutsche Bank and I can understand that the German taxpayer doesn't want to pay for my school system or health system because we don't vote for each other governments. So there is an old liberal principle which is no taxation without representation, which is quite well funded. No, and I and I think that it could be stretched a bit, a bit for modern times. So there is no managing the public budget without political representation, which also, of course, has, has implications for what was said before. Germany cannot take on Germany or any other sovereign national institution cannot take complete control of Italian budget or Spanish budget because there is no political representation allowing for that. So either we give up democracy or we find a way in which we can have, I mean, that's a very strange animal, and a unified uh, economic, commercial, and monetary area with different national governments and no fiscal transfer. I don't know if this is possible, but if it is possible, we have to find out what are the ways in which such a thing can work. And uh, I think that uh, for the moment, either we go towards, uh, you know, and that will be discussed in the next, se next section, some form of, you know, a small budget, a small fiscal contribution for each national state guaranteeing uh, and a small taxation, let's say, so a small, inter, you know, mingling with the fiscal system can then be used to uh, to sell uh, some bonds that can be seen as safe assets implicitly because there is a guarantee from the EBC. So the EBC, the European Central Bank, is crucial anyway for any way out of the crisis, <laughs> and then we can use that money for a big plan which can be a European plan, so that it's, it's not a transfer to anyone or a grant to any one country, but it's simply spending money as a stimulus and, uh, you know, creating an infrastructure, doing good for all countries in Europe. Or otherwise, uh, I don't know, I mean, if the central bank does not uh, put down the interest on, a, on a Italian and Spanish or French, you know, if there is no control of the spreads, uh, the thing is cannot work in the long run, in the medium run. Thank you, Antonella. Uh, I would uh, hand over the last word to uh, Frank. Um, maybe also again to this question, I was a little provocative at, uh, in my first uh, question, but I think it's, it's really a real issue. I mean, how can we argue uh, convincingly to people who now struggle with health, health issues or very fundamental uh, problems like jobs and, and so on that we now need a green uh, plan or a green deal. Um, what is your main argument or how would you formulate this in a, in a broader strategy? Um, thanks, Thomas. Just to check, you can hear me now. Okay. Yes. Um, so, so the first thing to say is, is that it, this is why it's crucial to get the, the, the phases in the, this crisis response clear between the emergency maintenance and recovery phase. Part of my job for the past three weeks has kind of almost been doing some damage, not necessarily damage control, but speaking to campaigners and trying to rein in 
you know, the urge to go out there and, and talk about climate change right now because I do understand and, 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 and actually they do too that, that there's a huge um, concern about, you know, simply getting cash to businesses and, and to households to keep them afloat. Um, having said that, the, 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 when it comes to the recovery phase, there's a few, few different things. The first one is um, we have a choice. The, the lines in the sand are being drawn right now. It is either green or brown. That is how we need to think about this recovery phase and, and, and climate change. Um, I, I'd, I'd say it more in, in terms of the, when it comes to the recovery phase, we have an opportunity to hit, two, you know, to so, bad analogy in an environmental sense, but to hit two birds with one stone. That, that's the first thing I, I would say. The second thing is we shouldn't think about um, green jobs and a green recovery as as this kind of false dichotomy of, of only kind of infrastructure type of investment. My, my presentation was mainly geared towards infrastructure, but there's plenty of green jobs, um, uh, you know, in, in healthcare, in our social security system that, that are available, you know, nurses jobs, social care type of jobs, which in many type of parts of, of the EU and in the UK are missing. And there's, there's ample possibility to create those types of jobs. Um, and, and the, the third thing is that we, we need to be very clear that this crisis um, is not the same as 2008. I think Robin made that point before as well, um, or Sony did. Um, and, and this crisis is revealing the frailties in our weight welfare system while 2008 revealed the frailties in our, in our financial system. And so I do think a substantial portion of the, um, the recovery package needs to be geared towards getting, um, you know, boosting the incomes of, of households, getting money into the real economy and, and getting cash to businesses. I, I just think that there, there are ways that you can do, do this in a green way. And then finally, I, you know, I, I think you could, for example, have a money finance helicopter drop that sits very nicely alongside um, some, you know, a, a green infrastructure type of investment program um, as well. I hope that answers your question sufficiently and that you could hear it too. Thanks a lot. Very, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the debate is open and we will have another uh, discussion on the um, question on how to make us more resilient, which is touching very much this at the end of our day. Um, so the, uh, quite a little bit later. Um, I would like to thank uh, all of you for this nearly G7 conference between Rome, Paris, Washington, London, and Berlin. Uh, just, just one missing, I think, Canada um, or two. And um, happy to have you here. And I think, I mean, clearly enough, uh, we already touched the mo probably most important questions of this week, which is how will the Eurozone handle this uh, crisis? And we've been going to discuss this. We already did and will continue to discuss this in the next session. And I'm seeing the number of participants growing, uh, which is probably due to the fact that there are a lot of people interested in especially this question again. Um, so um, thanks again. And we will have a, now a bit, bit more than 10 minutes break. Uh, so use it and whatever, take a coffee or uh, breathe. And then we'll reconvene at uh, 15. And I hope you all, all will be back then <laughs> because the discussion should be open and you may intervene again. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Antonella, Robin, and Shaheen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.